My name is John Barker. I am the director of the American Cyber League here at Cyberbytes Foundation. And during the month of October, we are bringing you a series of cyber chats in honor of Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Now, if you're new to Cyberbytes Foundation and have never heard of us before, let me give you just a brief overview of what we're about. Cyberbytes Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit just a couple miles south of Quantico Marine Corps Base. We have three core missions, education, innovation, and outreach. For education, we have the Cyberbytes Academy. I am standing in one of our classrooms where we are CHEV approved to teach CompTIA A+, Network+, Security+, ISC squared, CISSP, and certified ethical hacking. We also have run numerous STEM-based summer camps that have focused on drones, robotics, AI, programming, you name it, we're working on doing it here. So right now I'm printing out a Godzilla figurine for the city project. Uh, it's going to be attacking Quantico 2, electric boot. American Cyber League is our program aimed at innovation, and that is the piece that I am responsible for. We have a membership group made up of over 1,000 individuals, small and large businesses, government institutions, and educational institutions to help drive collaboration in emerging technology as well as cybersecurity. Above me on the second floor, we have 10,000 square feet being built out for a variety of cyber labs. We have machine learning, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, election security, industrial control systems, and Internet of Things, just to name some of the few that are in the works right now. forward to this discussion. Um, this, this type of presentation, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, so I like to have <laughs> feedback from, from, my, from my clients or the people that I'm speaking with. So if, if they're at, during this uh, presentation, if you feel like you write some notes down, make some comments, please forward it to, to myself and John. That would be great. I'd love to hear some feedback. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with myself every day, so I, I'd like to have feedback. So as we're looking at the um, the this, uh, this presentation, um, what I'm doing is I'm going to tie in our role in the CARES Act with the current act that's in in consideration by Congress and by in the Senate, a bipartisan um, uh, bill that is meant to improve cybersecurity for small businesses. Uh, we're also going to tie this to what we're doing with the CARES Act and tie it back into what the Defense Department is doing to protect confidential information within the de defense industrial base. Um, so Mer our role is in supporting small businesses in the United States and its territories. And you'll see that America's Small Business Development Centers, we have um, over 3,000 advisors that um, are in nearly a thousand locations in the United States and its territories. Um, we, we do have the role in the CARES Act to protect intellectual property of small businesses. We're funded by the Small Business Administration and we're their boots on the ground. Um, we touch over a million small businesses a year and directly work with um, businesses on their 
uh, business plans, their marketing plans, help them set up bookkeeping according to generally accepted accounting principles. We help them get access to capital and make financial decisions on how to best help their organizations grow and thrive. So as we go through this this information, the the care the act uh, the small or uh, the cybersecurity small organizations act asks for simple and basic controls for small businesses. We know now that small businesses need protection. They're very important and they have a difficult time with all the technical information that's being thrown at them. We do need simple and basic information that the these small businesses can do something with right now. They're very distracted, obviously, with, with what's happening with the virus. They're try just trying to stay in business. And so, so simple and basic approaches are critical right now more than ever. Uh, the, the CARES Act asks, asks us to protect intellectual property and provide cyber training. So as we consider intellectual property a subcategory of confidential information, our focus is on a higher level of confidential information. That may include personal information about your employees. It may include information about your customers, like credit card information, your clients directly, contract information or information that they're sharing that they don't want to be made that they don't want to be made public, right? So you look at you, everyone out there knows that someone who's had their credit card breached, or probably you have, and um, everyone knows someone that has had something about them personally posted on a social media account that has caused harm to that person. So this this relates to everybody. It, it's it, business information is critical. We need to we need to protect it, but it is it's also very personal. Um, as we look through what, what we're, how the cybersecurity model is, is, is called out, and the Defense Department calls it the cybersecurity model certification, they have a basic level that goes through to advanced levels. We are starting off with the basic level that addresses this need in, the, in both acts of basic and simple controls that people can understand. And um, again, our, we're, we're called out, our mission is to help small businesses start, grow and thrive. And that lines up really well with all these things because you're not gonna be able to grow well if you're not protecting your information or thrive. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on the, the, um, the act, the Improving Cybersecurity for Small Business Act. They are asking to include small and basic controls like we talked about a little bit earlier, but we're looking at that against common cybersecurity threats and risks. So we know that what these common risks are now, and we do know that if you take some basic steps that you're gonna be able to protect your organization pretty well, not just perfectly, but you're gonna be able to do some things that will significantly help you. Doing nothing creates a lot of problem. Um, they're recommending that uh, that the measure, they want the, the CISA, the newly formed agency from the Department of Homeland Security to recommend measures for small organizations. And um, they, the act is actually asking them to be consistent with the approaches from the National Institute of Standards or NIST. Uh, and we feel that our, our program addresses all that. Um, as, we, as we look at the CARES Act in detail, then we're asked to develop continuity of operations guidance uh, for small businesses. Um, this ties in very well into cyber data breaches. If, if you have a cyber attack or a data breach, then you need to figure out how to keep your organization running. So there is continuity of operations. If information was stolen, um, we tend to think of information stolen, but if information was modified, so the integrity of that information was compromised through an attack, then you need to figure out how to reach, come back and have the continuity of operations necessary to keep you moving. Uh, we, it's called out to, calls us out to protect the intellectual property that we talked about earlier and to help mitigate uh, cyber threats online. So this really ties in really nicely to, uh, all this ties in really nicely to basic concepts for um, cyber and data protection. So as we then look at the cybersecurity maturity model that we're addressing from this, the Defense Department, um, it has the basic level as well. So um, previously there's, organizations have had difficulty because it's like swallowing, they feel like it's swallowing an elephant. They're just, just too much information. That this is the first time that, that um, someone with authority, the Defense Department, 
um, has come up with something that really addresses things at the basic level to get organizations started. So we're really excited about that, and you'll see that uh, reflected in some of the from some of the other slides. We are planning on incorporating some additional concepts into the uh, the cybersecurity model that that bring in the the cybersecurity framework concepts that identify, detect, protect, respond, and recover that are part of that. It's kind of a, a time uh, a, a history of this. The Defense Department acknowledged that intellectual property was being stole national of national interest and of the interest uh, for any one of the organizations within the defense industrial base. Uh, we took a look at what they were doing uh, from the SPD stand standpoint. We adopted this model because we believe it does a good job in helping us spread awareness uh, and in, in helping us show empirical evidence of, of behavioral change. Um, the defense industrial base moves a little bit towards the, the a lot towards getting it certified. Um, in the next couple of years, the contracts will be coming out to force organizations that do business with the Defense Department to be certified. The private sector is adopting this as just good business practices. And um, you'll see in the private sector, you'll see organizations move towards either a self-attestation, third-party attestation, or at some, in some points, we'll go through the formal assessment process for formal certification from this cybersecurity maturity model uh, accreditation body. Um, as we as we look at this, we're we're seeing the opportunity for our advisors to bring uh, their business domain knowledge into this, because th because we have a standard way of looking at something, it's going to make it easier for them to do that. And we'll also see the friction being reduced in the market for products and service companies, third parties that want to come in and help small businesses, because there's some continuity in the way that we're doing that. They'll be it'll be easier for them to align their messaging to the clients as they have a better understanding of what the cybersecurity maturity model is, that they'll be able to align their messaging to that and reduce that friction and help the small businesses understand what value these companies are bringing and make an informed business decision against that. So how do we do some of these things? So some of our lessons learned here were that as we started training organizations on the model, we took the clarifications out of the model that were that were provided by the Defense Department for complicated controls, and th they put them in business language that people can understand. And so, as we as we expose these these concepts to our clients and to our advisors, we ask them to give us examples of how that is how these things affect them within their or own organization. I'll give you an example. Um, I, before. The, um, when I first started and started creating the deck that you'll see part of in a minute, um, I, I passed it off to our chief operating officer and vice president of our organization. I asked her what this is. And so she, she looked at it for a few hours and she came back to me. She said, this is a really great document that describes how to protect information. And it looks like a cybersecurity document. Uh, and I, I, I see this and, and that's why we locked our doors, we put locks on our doors. Everybody in our office complained when I put locks on the doors, but it's not just cyber. We have very confidential information on our desk every day in the form of paper, and people can walk in and out of the office and get exposed to that. It might be a personnel record, it might be a health record of somebody in the organization. And that's why we put dual factor authentication on our accounting system, because we found our our, our cleaning service one day playing games on the accounting system. So we, we, we felt the dual factor authentication took care of that problem. So she put that in her terms and that's important. If, it, if, you, if she was a restaurant owner, operator, or if she was an attorney, then she would have put that in her terms. And so as we're doing this, as we're pulling this information out of our clients, getting these examples, we're creating these pool, this pool of knowledge so we can share across our network of 4,000 advisors. That so that we have some level of continuity in the way that we're doing messaging and we're coming to the coming to these clients in their voice. It's really important for them to come to, for us to come to them in their voice. Um, also, this provides an opportunity for third parties like the Federal Trade Commission, who we've interviewed last week on uh, personal identifiable information and other subject matter experts to provide really good examples that are meaningful for these organizations. Um, so the next couple of slides are are the same slide pulled out of a, a deck of 17 that we use to train or make aware, make our clients aware of the cybersecurity maturity model, basic level one. And you'll you'll you'll, you'll see an example here where the first slide 
is what we would call something that might be used for a federal contractor or just a, gen a general slide that has some people sitting around a computer. Don't allow uh, sensitive information to become public. Great, great. Simple, easy thing to understand, right? And on the bottom, you'll notice that the term company is used, a company website. You'll see that, that referred to twice on, on, on this page. If we go to the next slide, which represents the same information, this might be something that a, a restaurant would look at. So you have a picture of someone in a restaurant. We, we, we use the term restaurant instead of company in both of the situations on the bottom. When we talk about the owner of a restaurant, we use the term operator because that's what they're comfortable in. But we don't want to change the core content, the clarification given in the CMMC. We need to have that solid and not interpret that as we help organizations understand that. We do need to come to them in their voice. That's just a little subtlety that's really critical. Um, so what we realize as we're going through this, this is a perfect alignment as we have 40 years of helping people set up their bookkeeping. We don't do their accounting for them. Um, we don't tell them how to do their accounting, but we do help them set up their bookkeeping according to generally accepted accounting principles. If you're a business owner, you understand when you set up your books, you really need to follow the generally accepted accounting principle as you do that. Otherwise, you'll, there's no way that you're going to be able to grow when you have your your uh, your uh, CPA come in to do your auditing internally or auditing. You're just going to have difficulty. We have someone coming in potentially to acquire your business or look at your your business because they want to, you may want to have a loan, then you need to have real discipline associated with that. So we look at the, the cybersecurity maturity model as providing that generally accepted data protection principle associated with that. Think of that as that framework. It doesn't tell you how to do things. It tells you what to do. And um, we do need a discipline approach and we, de we do need to secure that information um, we see an awful lot of, of, of companies out there just keeping track of assessments on spreadsheets and databases that aren't secure. We do need to secure that. So we work with an organization and we, we acquired a grant from an organization called Continuum GRC. It's a small veteran owned organization that has a that is now on FedRAMP moderate, which is a FedRAMP is an, an assessment by the federal government to test that the security of your cloud software as a service offering. And so, because we are the boots of the GS or the uh, SBA, then we felt that we needed to take a higher level look at the way that we're um, helping small businesses protect that information. And that 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 tool is available to any small business now at, for free for level one of the CMMC. That about wraps it up. I, I want to keep this very simple, but I, I would love to have your input on how maybe your organization can help small businesses, how, how you'd work with uh, with John's organization as well. And John, are you still there? I'm still here. Oh, good, then I'll stop sharing the slide. And uh, there you are, there you go. Thanks, Charlie. I got one quick question. I'm, I'm familiar with the SBDCs in the, in the communities. At what stage did, did your organization decide to get into the cybersecurity realm as I'm more familiar with them from business planning, accounting, things of that nature, marketing? Well, that's a great question. So um, a year and a half ago, I asked uh, the, 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 the White House who is protecting small businesses in the United States, who is responsible for that. And um, so they, they suggested I speak with the SBA and the SBA suggested I speak with America's Small Business Development Center. So we had, this was my, I guess it's almost two years ago now, we, we had a number of programs that were just helping with general awareness with, at the time, right? We really focus on business. Then we realized that, that this is an important thing that needs to be incorporated into everybody's business model, not in their business plan and in their opportunities to use this as an opportunity. We also realize that when companies are going after uh, products and services associated with this, they have to make true financial decisions associated with that. They need to get access to capital. So one of our 40 roles in the, in the, in the 40 years history of our organization is that we will actually sit down in person with the organization, help them write 
a loan application and walk them into under we know where the where the different banks are that like certain types of businesses and that will understand things we know how to write the business loan application so that a loan officer would look at that and, and be more likely to help the organization we we know how to help people make business decisions on this so that so we if, this is just such a natural thing as far as from the business side of this understanding this it's, it's, it's critical for all businesses to understand this. Now, how to do this, uh, um, we, we touch a little bit within some of our small business to center, centers go into this a little bit more detail, but we work closely with third parties, with organizations like yours that have so much to offer to, to help these organizations really figure out how to do that, how to set things up. We're not gonna go in and, and set up a router or, or a switch or something like that, right? But we do need to understand uh, that that they're doing something, and the they, at some point they will stand in front of a judge. The judge may be their parents, if the parents own their business. It may be angel investors. It may be stockholders. May be citizens that are that that are concerned about this, or maybe someone like the Defense Department that's telling them that they have to do this and be certified. So at some point, it's it, this is really critical, and it is a it is a true business decision, and because we have. The this this strong history of understanding how these people do businesses, how they do their business, and how we can best talk to them about that. We we feel we're we're putting ourselves in that position to help them with this. That no, that's fantastic. I would say uh, a lot of people obviously get into all kinds of different arenas. What their specialty are: real estate, uh, restaurants, things of that nature. They're very good at cooking. So thinking about cybersecurity, protecting data, protecting the papers on the desk. It, it's, it's not something that probably naturally comes to mind and being able to your approach to this, meeting them where they're at, I think is the best way to, to get more people to adopt a security mindset. Yeah, it does have to be habit. So you'll see like this video is very short. You know, we talked about doing a longer one. We think it, 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 these, these, this, this informative type of video needs to be short. So a lot of our content is like two minutes long, short and sharp so that people can be sent this information and, and an employer can reasonably assume that, that an employee will see that message and get through it before the, the next text comes that through that they have to, or next uh, email that they have to respond to. So we really need to get this embedded in the way that they, the natural way of them doing business. And these concepts aren't difficult. The, CM, the cybersecurity maturity model has done a great job of moving this into the, like I said, the basic, the basic support of uh, for, for cyber hygiene and data protection. Definitely. Uh, one final question. What's the best way for people that are like, I need to get on, on board with this. I know they can go check out the free tool. We'll have the slides available so you can go get the link for that. But is it best for them to reach out to you or reach out to the local SPDC, uh, depending on what region of the country they're in? Well, it's, it is. So if you go to the Americas, Americas SBDC.org website, you'll find a a tool there to find your local small business development center. Um, we are ramping this up right now. Some centers are, are are coming on board and some are very advanced with this right now. So um, it's, but it's important for you to talk to a small business development center, your local support. And uh, the worst case is you're gonna, they're gonna help you with your business. It's, a, it's a, they're, they're a great group of people. You'll find that they're really dedicated to help you flourish. Um, you'll be seeing more national stuff. So if, if organizations want to sponsor activities, I would encourage them to contact me or if they have some information about how they may help small businesses do this, I would encourage them to contact me so that we're, we're looking through these different companies and, and, and helping, them, help, helping them understand how to get to small businesses. It's really important. We don't have a charge for our services, so we're not selling anything, right? We don't sell products or services. Our true goal is to help small businesses flourish. So we want to create this 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 ecosystem that 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 allows small businesses to protect small businesses and even the larger organizations to do that. We're, we have we're establishing relationships with several uh, business associations that are bringing value to this as well. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time today, Charlie, and I hope everybody takes advantage of the free resources from America's SBDC. Thank you. Super, thank you.
Hey, my name's Adam. Uh, this Tuesday, I'm going to be covering uh, some additive manufacturing information for you all. Um, so let's get started. I've got a couple of slides to, uh, to give you a brief overview of the field, and uh, we'll be going through a demonstration about how you might prototype a part uh, using a 3D printer. So here we go. So the, the main difference between additive and conventional subtractive manufacturing is uh, that additive adds material. Um, you can build a part by adding layer or la on layer, or, uh, or you can build a part by adding layer upon layer of material um, until you get a finished part. Whereas uh, conventional subtractive manufacturing, like machining, like uh, milling on, the, on a milling machine or a lathe, um, starts with a blank that you then remove material from to get it to your final shape. Um, this has some rather far-reaching implications as far as uh, the manufacturing process goes. Uh, we'll get into those. So the first and uh, maybe most obvious part here is that um, 3D printing is really very slow. Uh, as, as far as the manufacturing technique goes, it's, um, it's up there in, in some of the slowest options you can do. Uh, if you have a plastic piece you need to make, you, you have two options here. You could injection mold it. You could churn out you know, dozens of them every couple seconds. Or you could 3D print it and take an hour or two. Um, there's reasons why you might want that. Uh, but in any case, um, depending on the size and complexity of your print and what your settings are, uh, a print can take anywhere from 10 minutes to, you know, three days. So, uh, you know, it r depends on what you want to make, I guess. Um, the biggest advantage of 3D printing is that you don't need any tooling or production capacity at all. You don't need a $20,000 injection molding machine. Um, all you need is a 3D model and, you know, play with a couple settings and a couple hours later you have your completed part. Uh, it's very handy for rapid prototyping in that. Uh, field. Um, as far as strength, 3D printed parts are essentially always weaker than uh, equivalent injection molded or even cast parts. Um, you, uh, a machine part generally has favorable strength characteristics in comparison. The biggest, uh, the biggest downs or the biggest reason this is the case with 3D printing is um, layer adhesion. Uh, when you build a part out of layers of plastic that are put down one by one, uh, you run into the issue that the layers don't quite stick all the way together. They're not a single solid piece. Because 3D printed parts are built out of layers, um, they're generally weakest along the axis of the layers. The layers don't stick together as well as they would in a, a single solid piece. Um, that's a significant compromise. You can work around it with design and how you print a part, um, but compared to something like injection molding where strength is pretty uniform all, all around, um, it's something to consider. Also consider that uh, in this graph we have here on the, the right, um, uh, injection molded parts tend to deform a lot more before they completely fail, whereas 3D printed parts tend to fail very abruptly. They reach the same peak strength um, generally, but they are much less flexible because the, uh, the layers will give way all at once. Now, a, pro a compromise that uh, a lot of people have run into with this is that high performance plastics don't tend to 3D print well. There's a lot of um, aerospace plastics or um, it, that are either high density or very strong or they work well at high temperature and most of them tend to be a real challenge to actually make come out of a 3D printer, if it's possible at all. Um, some common ones are uh, polyethyl ether ketone. Um, that's used in some aerospace applications as a substitute, or substitute for aluminum. Uh, it needs things like a, a heated chamber, heated at 200 degrees centigrade. Or even a more common option would be nylon. And most people don't think of nylon when they think of a super high performance plastic, but it's pretty strong. Um, and it's really quite a pain to 3D print. A lot of this has to do with the fact that high performance plastics print at higher temperatures. And the higher temperature you get, the more prone your parts get to warpage because one part of the, 
or uh, one section of the part is going to be considerably hotter than another and thus expanded. Um, another reason is that long chain plastics really don't come out of a nozzle very well. If you have something like ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, that, that's a pretty low melting temperature. In fact, very friendly for a 3D printer. You'd think it'd be possible. But in practice, it clogs almost every time because the polymer chains are just too long. They get all tangled up and jam the nozzle. Uh, so these are some limitations that are not always present with injection molding because um, you don't really have to worry about uh, tiny nozzles with injection molding as much. Um, there are metal printers, though, um, and their parts are strong. They're not as strong as forged or machined parts, um, but they can be made uh, fairly rapidly, and they don't need any tooling to do so. There are different uh, metal manufacturing or metal printing techniques um, that we'll cover in a moment here, uh, but it's important to note that sintered variants are generally significantly weaker than melted. So another chief advantage for 3D printing is the geometry you can manufacture a part in. Rather than um, being limited by a uh, hand machining setup. So for example, uh, if you're going to hand mill something, generally your part's going to be composed of straight lines and um, simple features. Uh, if you have a CNC machine, uh, you know, a CNC milling machine, that's, um, you can get around that limitation, but there's a few things it can't do. And the biggest one is the fact that 3D prints um, can be hollow. You can, uh, essentially, you could print a ping pong ball with the air inside, um, which is like a perfectly sealed ping pong ball. And now it's, that's very difficult to do with any other manufacturing technique. Ping pong balls are blow molded, so there's a hole and they're inflated. But um, 3D printed parts aren't limited by this. And this has led to their adoption in uh, particularly the field of rocketry. Um, regeneratively cooled rocket engines run their uh, cold fuel through the combustion chamber and nozzle walls. Um, the idea being to transfer heat to the fuel to help it burn better, but more importantly, keep the rocket from melting. Um, in, in old, you know, times of old, this was uh, achieved by essentially brazing together thousands of narrow pipes. Um, it was incredibly labor intensive, it was failure prone, and as a result, exceedingly expensive. Um, in the, uh, the black and white picture there, that's a uh, Saturn, uh, Saturn V's engine, it's an, an F1 rocket line. And on the right is an engine that's almost completely 3D printed, made by a company called Rocket Lab, uh, based out of New Zealand. Um, so we have some basic types of 3D printers. Um, The most common type you're going to see is a fused deposition modeling printer, or FDM, or sometimes called FFF for fused filament fabrication. Um, both these printers are FDM printers, um, and in fact, almost all the ones you'll see will be. Um, the idea is that a plastic filament on the spool is fed into this heated nozzle, it melts, and is extruded out the bottom onto this bed. Layers are placed down, and gradually the part is built. Uh, these are nice because they're relatively simple and cheap. Mechanically speaking, there's not a whole lot going on here. You know, you have your axes that move and your hot end that actually melts the plastic and the extruder to push it in. But aside from that, it's a relatively simple structure. Um, the other thing is that because it can, in theory, these are compatible with most thermoplastics. Some print better than others. Um, like we were talking before about long chain polymers and stuff. Uh, you know, those don't work as well. Um, but you're not limited in your material choice. You can print with things like um, polyethylene terephthalate or uh, polylactic acid or acrylonitrile butadiene styrene. It's, you have a lot of options at your disposal for whatever part you're making. So these are great for structural components. Another common kind, though, is an SLA printer. Uh, that's short for stereolithography. Um, Basically what these are is a tank of photopolymer resin. That's a, uh, a plastic resin that cures when it's exposed to UV light. It hardens. Um, moving mirrors direct a laser to focus on different points in the tank uh, and cure the resin selectively. The big advantage here is that um, your only limitation for print quality is basically 
how accurately you can move the mirror. And frankly, that's, that's not so difficult to engineer. Um, the, the biggest disadvantage, so, so you can achieve much higher print quality than most other print system, or, uh, manufacturing methods with an SLA printer. Um, the biggest disadvantage is that you don't have a lot of materials to choose from. You're basically stuck to photopolymer resin, which the resins like that aren't particularly strong. They also tend to cure when exposed to UV light um, after they've been finished. So if you were to take an SLA printed part and leave it outside, the UV light would degrade it extremely rapidly. So uh, there's that to consider. A variant on SLA is DLP. That's um, digital light processing. It's, uh, it's a little different. It uses an LED projector aimed by a, a micro mirror. Um, so that's basically a compact mirror that works, uh, or that's um, directed by electromagnetic fields. It's very small. Uh, now DLP is significantly faster than SLA because it can cure an entire layer at once um, rather than tracing a laser across every point you want to print on. Um, however, print quality is usually lower as a result since you're pretty much limited by the resolution of your LED projector. Um, rather than the precision of your laser. Um, now, a, a third alternative that's eh, somewhat grown in popularity is an LCD printer. Um, this is LCD just like your TV or computer screen. Um, it's very similar to a DLP printer, but uh, instead of having an LED projector aimed by a micro mirror, it uses an LCD screen that emits ultraviolet light. Um, the idea is that you can basically flash into existence one layer at a time. Uh, and this is, this is beneficial for speed because it's extremely quick. Um, and it's also, uh, it, it doesn't tend to suffer from pixel distortion as much. Sometimes DLP can get misaligned and the pixels get um, twisted slightly. You know, your print can get stretched and it can be a pain to solve that. Um, LCD doesn't really do it so much since it's a straight line right to the first layer from the LCD. Uh, now we get into metal printing. There are a few kinds and they're, they're generally variants on the same basic system. So this, this is the most common type. You'll see it's a powder bed fusion machine. There's a lot of variants here, um, including, for example, selective laser silt sintering, um, selective laser melting, electron beam melting, um, and essentially the main difference is the extent to which they heat the powder and the uh, mechanism they use to do so, whether it's a laser or an electron beam. Um, the, basically what happens is powder is dispensed onto a bed that goes down and the powder is smoothed over, then the laser traces a shape and another layer of powder is applied. Um, gradually it builds up the part and uh, at the end you get rid of the excess powder and you have a finished part. Another option that you don't see quite as often is metal binder jetting. Um, this one's actually significantly cheaper than the other, mainly because of how it works. Um, instead of actually heating and melting the metal powder uh, with a laser or an electron beam, it uses uh, basically an inkjet nozzle to jet in a liquid binder, basically a glue to stick these pieces together. Um, once you've printed, you have a very fragile part that's... Uh, basically metal powder that's been glued together. Um, you put it in a furnace, uh, the binder burns off, and the metal particles stick to each other. Um, they, you know, they center and the edges stick. Uh, mechanically speaking, this is inferior to other printing methods. Um, you get a lot of porosity from the gas produced by the binder burning off, and um, you don't get complete adhesion like you would with, for example, selective laser adhesion. Uh, but it's... Um, significantly cheaper and it's faster because you don't have to uh, to melt the layers. Another option that's been used in some cases is uh, directed to energy deposition. There's a few variants of this but effectively it involves um, instead of heating powder um, it's it's basically an automated welding machine that builds parts with the weld bead. These are generally um, much lower quality parts as far as surface quality goes. 
Uh, but they're typically very strong because the metal gets melted entirely. It's, it's effectively a welder. Um, so in these pictures, you can see you have a laser or an electron beam that heats up the wire and melts it. Uh, there's another option that is not actually a specific kind of printer. It's a technique you can do with a typical FDM printer, and it's called metal material extrusion. Essentially, you can buy special kinds of plastic filament that have a very high percentage of metal powder embedded in it. Um, you print a part with the uh, metal material filament and send it off to uh, get put in an autoclave and melt it down. The plastic that was used to bind the filament together burns off, just like with uh, the, uh, the plastic that was used to bind the powder together gets burned off, just like with uh, binder jetting. Um, and it leaves you a centered part. Um, mechanically, these aren't very strong. Uh, and again, they suffer from the same porosity issues. Uh, but the big advantage is that you don't need a specialized metal printer to do so. Um, you can do it with one like this one, albeit with some modifications. Now, additive manufacturing has um, enabled a somewhat different process of design. Uh, there's a, there are new ways to create things now that, that weren't really possible before. A big one is generative design. Um, you see this in Autodesk's products. Uh, essentially, the idea is you set constraints and geometry to avoid and geometry to pass through, and it will automatically try to build a part. Um, as you can see, they look very unconventional compared to you know, most parts you'd make. This is the idea is that you're able to create um, pieces that would be very difficult for a human to design, uh, you know, prohibitively difficult but can optimize strength to weight or um, you know, strength within a given shape. Uh, there's a lot of options. And previously, these weren't really possible because these complex shapes are very difficult to manufacture by virtually any means. You can cast them a little, um, but to do that, you need to actually make an original part. Um, and this is something that 3D printing is very good at. Um, you can use things like support structures and stuff to have a really complex convoluted shape without actually um, requiring uh, a very long wait time. Now you can build a really complex shape with it. Um, uh, a variant on this is um, something called evolved components. Um, one of the interesting things you can do with this is you can have a computer program designed a part for you uh, that fits a really particular design goal that's very tedious to achieve by hand. Um, this one, uh, shown in the pictures here, was from the Space Technology 5 mission for NASA. Um, basically, they needed an antenna with a, a wide beam width, a circularly polarized wave, and a wide impedance bandwidth um, that covered X-band. Uh, so they, they were not having much luck designing this by hand, so they gave it to a computer program, they tested the things it spit it out, or it spat out, and um, those are some, uh, on the right side were some prototypes, but on the left side is the one that actually got accepted. And it turned out to be uh, something that'd be very difficult to achieve on your own, uh, but by simply brute forcing the problem, a computer could do it uh, fairly easily. Mm, one of the latest emerging technologies that you've probably seen some uh, word about is something called 3D bioprinting. Um, this involves essentially printing layers of living cells into a 3D part. You start with a, a sort of um, gelatin structure to keep the cells alive and inject them straight in. There's a few different varieties, um, and one of the, the most important things here is that uh, this is not possible via subtractive machining. Um, you cannot make uh, a living part by taking stuff away necessarily. You really have to add it. Now that said, uh, we are a really long way from being able to actually use this to do things like print organs. Um, there's a lot of challenges entailed in this. Uh, for example, how do you keep the cells alive? How do you put them exactly where you want them to be? Um, how do you get them to grow together once, once they're actually there? There's, these are tricky problems and people are working on solving them, but we're not all that close. Another potential option here for 3D printing that's also seen some press 
is printing in microgravity. You've seen uh, 3D printed parts on the International Space Station. Uh, and there's some interesting reasons for this. Uh, one of the biggest ones is that 3D printed parts have some uh, compromises that you have to make. They can't really do overhangs. They can't print plastic in thin air. They have to have infill for that same result. Um, and they can't really print all that hot because they'll collapse under their own weight if they're too soft and squishy. Um, if you don't have gravity to worry about, these are actually problems that could potentially be avoided. An overhang is, it doesn't really matter if there's no gravity to pull it down. Again, with that, uh, with that in mind, you don't need infill. Um, support structures should, aren't needed, and your print temperature could, in theory, be significantly higher. That would increase your layer adhesion and the strength of the final part without actually resulting in a deformed part. Um, it's not quite so easy as that, but it's, uh, it's certainly something that's seen a lot of research because it's a very interesting way to make things. Um, and a final interesting thing is, uh, and um, this is sort of an emerging kind of printer. It's based on a um, FDM printers like these, and it's a belt printer. The idea is that you have a nozzle and a hot end, just like an FDM printer, um, but instead of printing on a flat bed, it prints on a belt. Uh, the idea is that these printers are capable of printing continuously. They, um, they never really have to stop, uh, which is significantly handy. or you know, It's a great improvement for uh, in a production capacity, because you no longer need someone to clear the bed after every part made. Now I'm going to show you how I prototyped a part for this robot over here. Um, this is the part. It's a holder for the ultrasonic sensors on the front of the robot. Um, and it mounts them to the servo. In fact, you can see it right here. Uh, this is a part which 3D printers are kind of ideally suited for. Um, this part is rather strangely shaped. It would be very difficult to manufacture uh, by most other methods. Um, and the rapid production ability of a 3D printer meant I was able to um, design this and build it in an afternoon. Um, the the process I went through involved two prototypes and a final part. Um, so first, let's uh, walk through how I actually designed it. So we begin with the first sketch. This sketch is going to mark the outer ring that's going to hold on to the servo motor. We extrude the sketch up, creating a, uh, a physical shape. This, is, this will slot over the servo motor to uh, hold the entire assembly on. Then we make a sketch for the circuit board that the ultrasonic sensors are mounted on. Um, it's a rectangle. We measure the parts of, the, or we measure the figure or the physical parts and place it down. Then we extrude it to create a, uh, a three-dimensional stand-in for the actual board. And we add the mounting holes that are used for screws to bolt it on. From there, we add another sketch to the bottom. This will be the base plate of the uh, holder. The ho From there, we add a base plate to the bottom. This will be the bottom plate of the part used to hold the circuit board in place. We extrude it down, creating a three-dimensional object. Then we add another sketch indicating the positions of the ultrasonic sensors themselves. Uh, so we can see how to mount it. We give it a little bit of space and create these little tines to cup around it and um, hold on to the board without actually getting in the way of the ultrasonic sensors. We round the tines over so they print nicely and uh, are reasonably strong. And we round over these corners on the base plate. Next, we create another sketch. This sketch has two large circles here, and we'll make another one on the side of the part. These two circles are going to uh, effective, or this slot and these two circles are going to effectively mark out um, the start and end points for the arms. We loft the uh, we loft the a slot, or we loft the slot to one of the circles, 
and then loft it to the next one. Or, and then loft it to the next one. Then we mirror the two objects we've created, the two bodies, over to the other side of the part and fuse them, or fuse them to the original. This is now one part. We round over the edges for strength and punch holes through the screw holes um, and punch holes following the same paths as, as the screw holes from the uh, board itself. We now shrink the screw holes slightly so that they're undersized for the screws that'll fit into them. This will allow the threads to bite into the plastic and hold without needing a bolt. Then we trim the edges, add some more rounded sections for strength, and thicken the teeth that hold the board and the base plate. With that, we have a finished part. We can hide the components. And this piece should be what we need for the job. When I make 3D printed parts from scratch, I usually count on having two prototypes and one final part. The two prototypes allow me to refine the design, you know, adjust any uh, dimensions that were wrong and test it where it actually needs to go. The second prototype is used to refine in the print settings. We figure out what needs to be done and the final prototype is done with fine quality settings with the print so it takes significantly longer but results in a stronger and more aesthetically pleasing part. Um, I actually have all three prototypes here. Um, Yep, that's what I've got for you.